Hello, my name is Kirk Higgins. I'm the Director of Content here at the Bill of Rights Institute. And today we're going to be taking a look at the argument contained in the Declaration of Independence. Let's dive in. So whether this is the first time you've looked at the Declaration of Independence or the hundredth time you've looked at the Declaration of Independence, it's really great if you can take some time and really unpack what's going on. So that's what we're going to do today. And to do that effectively, one of the things we need to do is set ourselves sort of the historical context. So if you really want to know what the what led up to the moment of us declaring, the United States declaring independence, uh, I encourage you to take a look at our Road to Revolution homework help video. It'll give you all the background of everything that led up to 1776. But for the purposes of this video, I'm going to go through some really high level notes. So the first Continental Congress had been formed in September of 1774. And at that Congress, they're uh, in response to certain frustrations they had with the king in Parliament back in Great Britain. The Continental Congress had sent out a petition to the king in hopes of resolving their issues peaceably. They then formed a second Continental Congress in May of 1775 after the battles of Lexington and Concord. And it was during that Continental Congress that the Olive Branch, what's known as the Olive Branch petition was sent to the king and also a document called the causes and necessities of taking up arms was also sent to the king. So the second Continental Congress is the actual Congress that would stay in session and eventually pass the Declaration of Independence. Although it passes in July of 1776, debate over whether or not independence should be declared started all the way back in June. And it was during a long and rancorous debate uh, that on June 11th, a committee of five was actually established to write and draft the Declaration of Independence. Why is this important for what we're looking at today? Well, it's really important to remember that it's not just Thomas Jefferson who's drafting the Declaration of Independence. It's both this committee of five, which was made up of John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, of course, Thomas Jefferson, Robert Livingston, and Roger Sherman. But it's also that the Congress itself was debating over what the words would say and made extensive edits on the document. So it was on July, it was back in June, as I mentioned, when this was happening, uh, the debate was so rancorous, they couldn't come to any sort of consensus. On June 10th, they decided to table the debate for three weeks. And it's in that intervening time between June 10th and the end of June, about June 28th, that the declaration is actually drafted. That draft is presented to Congress, given over for lots of edits, uh, actual handwritten edits, uh, before the Congress is called back into session. The resolution for independence is passed on July 2nd, and the actual wording of the document is, is passed, affirmed by the Congress, and sent out uh, as the declaration on July 4th. That's why we celebrate on July 4th. So remembering all this context is important as we dive into the actual argument of the document itself. So taking a look, Let's remember in Congress, July 4th, 1776. It's important because this is a statement by all of the members assembled unanimously here, the Declaration of the United States of America. So it's the Declaration, United being lowercase, also interesting. Uh, it is not the United States as we know it today, but it is the United coming together states of America that are making this declaration. So they start out with this beautiful opening line, which we're all probably familiar with, but if not, it's important to read the words. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So basically what they're saying here is, Look, we're going to be declaring independence, but when that kind of thing happens, it's important for us all to take a step back and to explain why we're doing what we're doing so that the world can see them and justify them. So it's important here to keep in mind who are the audiences are talking to. Well, they're, of course, talking to other colonists living in the 13 colonies. They're talking to the people of Britain back in the in across the, the British Empire, letting them know. Um, in particular, we're talking about Parliament, so those elected officials in Parliament. Um, they're also communicating directly with the king, um, as it's his government, he is the sovereign. Um, and then finally, to other world powers. So when they're saying when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve, they're saying, look, if we're going to break away. We're going to let everyone know our reasons for breaking away to try to help others understand and hopefully impel support uh, from other world powers, but also so that the world can understand why the cause is what the cause is. So they go on and I've broken this section out. So it's actually just listed as a single paragraph on the document, but for sake of clarity here, I've broken it out because I think this is the heart of the argument that's being made. So they're gonna declare what was going on. Here they are declaring their cause. We hold these truths to be self-evident. 
right? That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That sentence has been called sometimes the most famous sentence in the English language. Um, it's certainly a powerful one, but it's basically saying, hey, let's go back to the beginning. Central to our argument is this understanding that we are all created equal, that we have equal rights. Now, because of that, they go on to say that to secure these rights, so because we are all equal, we institute governments in order to maintain that level of equality. And in order to do that, the just powers are from the consent of the government. So we are equal uh, to maintain that. We create governments to ensure that that equality may, is maintained. And for those governments to be legitimate, consent has to somehow be given because we are all, again, equal. We can't have people telling us what to do simply because arbitrarily they have power over us. And so when a government becomes destructive to those ends, so to these rights of equality, it, you can get together and you can alter or abolish it. In fact, they say it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute a new government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such a form so then shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So if the government isn't doing these things and it's not operating based off their consent, you have a right to revolution. You have a right to come together to abolish these things. But they say, hold on, prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be charged, changed, sorry, for light and transient causes. In other words, just because you can do this and you have a right to do this doesn't mean you should do this often. And in fact, you should be very careful, that's the word prudence, you should be very careful and wise when making this choice. It should only be when, the next section here, a long train of abuses and usurpations are driving you to do it. It shouldn't just be because you are frustrated or unhappy over small things, it should be big things that are happening over a long period of time that impel you uh, to do this. And so then they come, so we're equal, Governments are here to maintain that equality based on our consent. Uh, if the government is not doing that, uh, we should, you, you got to get rid of it, but you shouldn't just get rid of it because you think it's doing it. It really needs to be firmly established. And so that's when they go on to this last paragraph here to say, such has been the safe, the patient sufferance of these colonies. So in other words, they haven't wanted to. So their argument goes, they haven't wanted to break away, but they've been suffering patiently. They've done what they could to try to get people to understand their cause and yet they, they have not been successful. And so they're now gonna go through and lay out uh, their different grievances. Um, so they say here um, that uh, to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. So here you can see very clearly that they are looking to an external audience and they're gonna lay out subsequent this, 27 different grievances that they have with the king and parliament, um, specifically the Renity King, but to the king and parliament about what their problems are and why they've been compelled to do this. So going on, um, after those 27 grievances, they now recap. They say, all right, we told you our cause. We told you we've been suffering patiently. These are the things that continue to happen. Um, and by the way, even though they've continued to happen, this first paragraph is really interesting. Again, thinking back to our historical context, the petition of the king, the Olive Branch petition, all of these things that they've done. They say, we've petitioned for redress. We've tried to get this fixed, uh, but we've been unable to do so. And they say here, a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Pretty powerful stuff. It's saying, look, you have not listened to us. We have not made any headway. And so we are, you are unfit to lead us. Uh, and they then turn and say, not just the king, but our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. In other words, doing things that are outside of their consent, doing things that they don't agree with. They come down, they say, they too have been deaf to the voice of justice, right? They're, the British are not listening. Their British brethren are not listening to them. And so therefore, because of all of this, because of these 27 grievances, because of this foundational understanding of equality that they hold, because they believe that they have to have consent of the governed, they get to this point where they say, we must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. And so we get the final paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, which in fact is the actual Declaration of Independence. So they, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name 
and by authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare, and here it is, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish covenants, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Here it's them committing to this and saying, we are declaring our independence, we are absolving ourselves from the legal restrictions that Britain has placed upon us, and we are now saying that we are our own independent nation. So of course, going on from here, the war would rage on, the American Revolution would go all the way up until 1783. They of course passed the Articles of Confederation in that time um, to establish the first sort of constitution that establishes what the United States will look like as a governing body in an independent country. Uh, but this is the moment. And again, it's all predicated on that great argument that's pieced together here. Because we're equal, we need our representative rights to be, to be recognized as equals um, that requires consent uh, when a government is not seeing that consent or not giving it, not operating in a way that is affirming those natural rights, um, they must dissolve it. Uh, and so therefore they make this motion uh, to, to break away from the nation. So again, whether this is your first time looking at the Declaration of Independence or your hundredth time, it's always important to go back and look through the close worded arguments that are being presented to us and all of the texts and documents that we look at here at Close Reads. Uh, and the Declaration of Independence in particular is one that's really interesting when you're able to pull it apart and look at it really take a close look at uh, examining what that argument is that's being presented here. So thank you again for joining me as we step through it. I hope that you'll enjoy me for more close read sections and especially more of these explain series where I'm going to be looking at different documents from American history and really pulling them apart and taking a look at what are their essential elements, how do they come together, and what, what were they really saying, what did they really mean, and hopefully helping all of us come to a better understanding of what these seminal documents are. Uh, we also have my colleague Tony Williams has great conversations with scholars um, that I hope you'll tune in for. He's doing all kinds of interesting series this year. Uh, and also my colleague, Mary Patterson, looking at different visual primary sources, sometimes building, sometimes geography, and really unpacking how it is that we can look at, analyze, and understand those as well. So thank you so much for joining. I hope you'll stay tuned. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the video, and we'll see you next time.